I am Patty. I am Jackie. And together we are Grow Live, where we answer your farm and garden questions, offering garden knowledge of the best practices weekly. Our mission is to help you and others to grow a healthier world, one question at a time, one gardener at a time. Our goal is to help you to be successful in growing healthy food and even in creating a healthier planet. Yes. That's so that you know what, in Montana, we are so excited. It is raining this morning. And so we have been in a desperate situation where it looked um, pretty bad, right? Even the lawn grass was stressed out to the max. So we're super excited to have moisture and uh, all the early fruit trees are in bloom and things are exciting. and So things are going great. So what do we need to learn about this week, Jackie? People really want to know how they can get more nutrients into the plants they are growing. Jackie is Jackie Marie Beyer of the Green Organic Garden Podcast. And so together, we are trying to educate the everyday person, right? So we're not a PhD and we're not trying to teach the high level science. We're trying to get it as practical as we can so that we can go home and actually do it. And so the question this week is, is how to get more nutrients into our plants. And for me, that is why I have spent probably five, six, seven years now of uh, learning about soil life and what's going on in the soil, how the plant's going to work with that life in the soil, and how we can get nutrients back into the food because that's going to heal people, right, and become healthier. And I finally, this week, last week, it finally started coming together. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I've been studying, um, of course, you all, the people that know me know I've studied Nicole Masters in-depthly, and I've taken Elaine Ingham's online courses. But I've got to spend two uh, full days with Dr. Christine Jones, from Australia, and she is all about this quorum sensing. And after listening to podcasts, her podcast online, over and over and over, I finally think I've got it understood well enough that I can relay it to you. So we're going to figure out, and this is credit to her, how to get plants unaddicted from nitrogen fertilizer. And you're thinking, I don't have plants addicted to nitrogen fertilizer. Well, if you buy a plant from a greenhouse or a store, a big big box store, any of them, grocery store, it's coming pre-addicted to nitrogen. And we just don't know it, right? So I'm here to share with you, yes, it's coming addicted to, with the nitrogen already. Because when I've worked in the greenhouses, they just have a big barrel of liquid fertilizer there and it's um, got a little emitter that's sucking up a little bit of nitrogen in every blast of water that they put out on all their plants. So from day one, they're addicted to nitrogen fertilizer. And if we could get this thing figured out, then, um, then we would get our nutrients back in our food. We would start, right? So this is a big thing. This is the elephant in the room. So how are we gonna do that? We know nitrogen's super important, right? Because if we don't have enough nitrogen, this is what our plants look like. Pretty bad, right? So this was a tomato rescue I was telling you about last week, and we're into the 10 days of it. And these are severe nitrogen deficient plants. Where the plants normally get nitrogen, um, in the prairie, right? Before humans started deciding to do what we're doing, um, they was able to get it out of the air for free and the microbes process it. So where, where, are these plants getting it from? This is a plant I picked up at the greenhouse the other day because I, I make one planter that reminds me of my mother and grandmother. And so I have to have a geranium in it. I was going to say, is that a geranium? That's what my grandmother grew. And she kept hers from year to year to year. I was not ever keen enough to, to get that figured out. But anyhow, so this plant has been fed nitrogen fertilizer from day one, from the time that the seed went in the ground. And same with this pansy. So you think, well, okay, so what? You know, the greenhouse, right? In the greenhouse situation, 
when we sell these plants, we want you to go home and you be happy and the plant flower all summer long, right? I've gave it nitrogen every day in a greenhouse. So it is looking this grand when you take it home. So a really good greenhouse will tell you, suggest to you, please buy this fertilizer and give the plant fertilizer periodically throughout the growing season to keep it looking this good because it's addicted to the fertilizer. And our greenhouse caught on to, well, these people aren't doing what they're told or has to do. They skip the fertilizer part and then they whine come July that their flowers aren't doing well. So they started putting time release um, fertilizer in the soil. So now this plant has liquid fertilizer on it every day and time release in the soil. You're thinking, well, yeah, it makes plants look great. And it does, but it's not making them be nutrient dense. So when we start talking about going out of the greenhouse and stop worrying about just flowers and we wanna start producing food, we've got a problem. We've got a problem because of this nitrogen fertilizer. So this is a plant that was in that um, tomato rescue that I'm talking about. And a friend of mine gave me this flat of tomatoes that um, she couldn't get figured out. She already knew she had too many tomatoes. They were sicker than sick. And she's like, can you try to save them? So this is what the root looked like at the beginning, right? So that's pretty well a naked root. The soil biology is not working with this plant. So if this plant is addicted to nitrogen fertilizer, the nitrogen's just there, available to it. The plant doesn't know if it's been processed by the microbes or not. It's just nitrogen and the plant uses the nitrogen. So, but now the root is not colonized by the biology, which is key for how we're gonna get health down the road. This is what it should look like. Now this is not a tomato, but it's the same age as that tomato seedling. And that's what your root ball should look like if it's colonized with the microbes. So those microbes are now um, processing that nitrogen for free out of the air and giving it to the plant. And the plant is feeding the microbes, root exudates, everybody is happy. I mean, this is the happiest plant on earth. That's what we want, right? Compared to this, because which one's gonna do better in a drought? I think you guys know the answer to that. So, which one's gonna be healthier? This one was started with compost extract and worm castings. The same thing I've been talking about with you guys all along is that that is given the plant some microbes to work with and some food for the microbes. And now knowing what Dr. Christine Jones has totally got into my head, there's quorum sensing going on. So you think, well, what in the world is quorum sensing? So this plant also is gonna fight off pests and disease with this root system. This one is not. So come July, here in Tina, we're gonna have some issues down the road. Okay, and of course we can take up way more water with that one with the microbes are working with. So here's what I treated it with. Uh, compost extract, which is from a compost I made, worm castings and BioCoat Gold. Now you can buy really good compost and still do the same thing and not go through the process that I made to make the compost. But um, it is important to know that we have really good compost that's teeming with microbes and their signals, right? I'm gonna get into that as to what these signals are. And if you get to your hands in a compost and it doesn't stick to your skin like this, then um, you don't have very many microbes. So the microbes glue themselves to everything. They glued themselves to my hand. That's why my hand is imprinted with that. Here's the um, fit worm castings. So the BioCoat Gold I talk about is uh, from John Kemp. 
of advancing eco-agriculture. I'm not here to sell products or anything, but I've been using his product for three seasons now, and it works. And it's easy to buy, doesn't cost a lot, and it really makes you into a better gardener by just starting your plant at seed, seeding time by putting this on the seeds. And that's what it looks like. And here is our nitrogen deficient plant, right? And these are um, a lot of organic growers really struggle with how do we get enough of this nitrogen into the plant because they can't go and put on the, the liquid fertilizer as easily or they can't do the commercial fertilizer. It has to be organic fertilizer. So big problem. But these plants were treated with the compost extract and this is what they look like one week later after transplant. So I transplanted them. So they did go through a transplant shock and they did start responding to the compost um, treatment. So when we purchase a non-organic sourced plant, we're gonna come with this addiction. So if you could find a grower or a greenhouse that would grow organic plants, then we could skip this part. And we would start out with probably closer to the root that I just explained than these plants that are struggling with this nitrogen problem. So a tip before you buy the plant is to just sort of slip one out of its cell and see what's going on. Because we wanna reduce the stress that this plant's gonna go through when it gets transplanted. So I would 100% prefer to buy a plant that looks like this, the roots are just hitting the bottom of the tray versus one that is starting to be root bound like this. Okay, so when, when the plant gets root bound, now the root is sending signals to the plant. Hey, I've hit the bottom of the best soil. I can't go anywhere. So you might as well start growing your top now. And if you let the plant do that, now we have a little root ball with very few roots, dealing with nutrients, getting the nutrients into the plant, drought, all that stuff, because we have a small root system. Because it got the signal that, hey, I'm out of soil, I'm gonna grow the top now. Now we're gonna have a plant with a big top and a small root ball. And that's hugely stressful for the plant. Now it is our nutrient problem that we're not getting the nutrients into the plant that we are gonna eat to become healthy humans. So it all kind of goes around and around. Another way you can look at that uh, pot in a greenhouse or wherever you buy them from, pick it up, look at the bottom. If there's a lot of roots coming out of the bottom of that plant, it's already root bound. Now I have purchased a lot of plants that are root bound, but I know what to do with them and I'll share with that with you today. But today, right now, we wanna start understanding um, how we're dealing with, how these plants are gonna deal with nitrogen. This is a plant that uh, we dug up out of a cover crop at um, Steve Charters down at Billings. Colonized really nicely. Okay, well, it turns out from all of my education and definitely Dr. Christine Jones, um, these plants and microbes are communicating through quorum sensing, right? Because these plants can't see, the microbes can't see, the plants can't see. So how are they communicating? So it turns out um, a quorm that they're using is just like the quorm that you do in a club or a group where I've got to have so many people show up uh, and usually it's a percentage, you know, two thirds or, or three quarters or majority show up before we can vote on anything. Well, the same thing's going on with these microbes. Say if we look at this little green banana one, say it's bacteria, and it's bacteria that's gonna fix nitrogen. So we're gonna stick with that today to make this simple. We're just dealing with one bacteria that will fix nitrogen. So once that bacteria starts getting its population high enough to, to meet a quorum, then it can start sending signals to the other bacteria. And so they all start signaling together. That's called an autoinducer. And so once these bacteria are start sending out their signals, 
and auto dishers are going now amongst themselves and up to the plant. The plant receives a signal. Wow, there's bacteria in the soil that can fix nitrogen and all I need to do is feed them. So the plant starts doing photosynthesis and pumping out root exudates to this bacteria because of this signal that came from the bacteria. Very cool. Now, when the plant starts doing this and it's pumping out root exudates, it's feeding the microbes like crazy. It's not just feeding that one microbe, but it's feeding lots of them. The more the photosynthesis it can do, the more food it can pump into the soil for the biology. So the better that plant can do that, the more root exudates, the more food for the biology, the higher the number of that biology becomes. So as soon as those, um, this bacteria that's gonna make nitrogen available for the plant, it's just taking it out of the air or soil and converting it into what the plant can use. It does that by switching its genes once they are all getting this auto-inducing going on where they know we can, we can make an impact. And so they do it, they switch. Same way in humans, there's a bacteria that makes our vitamin Bs, right? And so if we have a diverse microbes in our gut, then we can make our, they can make our own vitamin Bs for us by switching their genetics. But if there's not enough of them, they never switch the genetics. That doesn't get turned on. So we've got to get the numbers up high enough to do it. So now the plant's like, oh, I got all this nitrogen available to me. And all I got to do is keep sending out these root exudates. Plants can go from somewhere around 10%, or I guess I suppose they could do none, but somewhere around 10% of root exudates all the way up to the 90s, 90% 90 of what the plant is getting from the sun can go down into these root exudates to feed soil life. It's amazing. So now these plants have made their switch. They did a gene switch. And I think a lot of people don't understand that uh, even humans, we're, I think, less than 10% human genetically, that the genetics in our body is really the microbes genetics, and same with these, these plants. Okay, now what happens when this human comes along and we apply nitrogen? Doesn't matter when, this could be on day one, because this plant is already working with the biology on day one, but if we give it fertilizer on day one, and in the greenhouse situation, it's daily. The plant senses there's nitrogen there, and it's like, well, there's no sense in pumping out root exudates because the nitrogen's there. So it doesn't. So it stops pumping out the root exudates. When it does that, now our microbes are like, whoa, there's no food here, plant, come on. And so they're sending signals, but not the plant's not receiving them. And then they quit. Then they're like, okay, I got a dud plant here. I might as well go to sleep, go dormant, or just die, right? They're just out of the game because this plant's not feeding them. The plant thinks I got all the nitrogen I need. All good and fine, right? For a little while, till the plant starts um, going further into production. So as a plant is now gonna get moving toward flowering and reproducing, it is pumping out more and more root exudates to try to wake up the biology to say, hey, I need nitrogen. And the biology is like, hey, we're done with you. You didn't feed us when we needed fed, so we're not going to respond. So they're not responding. The plant is sending out all this energy into the root system when it should be flowering and reproducing. So what happens to our quorum sensing now of these bad guys start 
make it a quorum and they start signaling and they attack the plant with the disease because our good guys that we wanted to be sending signals have quit. So then now it puts our plant into a bad situation. It's trying to reproduce. It's working twice as hard as it needs to be. And now it's gonna get attacked by a disease. And our production is gonna to go to crap, right? Drop off like crazy. So that is the short story of how the quorum sensing is working. So back to our real question is now, how are we gonna get more nutrients into our plant? Well, first you could buy, you could start your own plants, avoid someone else getting the plant addicted. That's in this case, that's what I've done, right? These plants are plants that I started from seed. So from day one on, they haven't gotten anything except for the extracts and um, the worm castings that I'll talk to you about. We do have to be consistent with it though. So whatever we decide to put on, same way with this liquid nitrogen, you'd need to be giving the plant some when it needed it because it's run out. In this situation where we're given a compost extract mixture, um, most people that I've been around and stuff that are doing this, they do it weekly. So by being consistent, the plant can count on it and knows that, um, and you're just really being a supporting system for the biology that's already there. And it's helping increase the population, right? So that we can get these quorum sensing to go in our, our direction and not the other direction. So I suggest we start by growing our own plants or buy them from a reliable source that's doing the regenerative practices. And definitely not somebody that's putting a insecticidal seed treat on seeds in the beginning. That's a whole nother workshop and a whole nother situation that we need to avoid completely. So start with clean plants. And then let's say, you, we know, okay, I've got certain plants that I can't grow or I don't like to grow or I don't have time to grow. Like even that pansy, that pansy, I would have had to start it clear back in January to got the pansy. And so if I'm gonna buy a plant and I do, and so do you, most people do. The very first thing you wanna do after we check the roots at the greenhouse, get the one that's not overly root bound still best looking plant that you can find um, in the middle of your trays, right? The plants on the outside corners of your trays are getting less water than the ones in the middle and less nutrients. That's just a little hint. Okay, so as soon as I get it home, the very first thing I'm gonna do is transplant ASAP. I'm gonna mix up my compost extract, worm castings, um, humic acid, um, kelp, whatever I'm gonna put in it, Right, I make a little jug of it, say it's a gallon, half gallon, put it in a bucket where I can dip the root ball down in it. So I'm gonna dip the root ball into that compost extract. Those microbes are gonna glue themselves to the roots and the soil just like they glued themselves to my hands when I put my hands in that rich compost. And then I'm gonna water and mix up that compost extract with rainwater or purified water. Or if you have to have chlorinated water, then you want to gas off that chlorine. Don't pour it right out of the faucet and then right in because it's that's going to kill some microbes for sure. Okay, and then uh, this is the mixture that I is my go-to one tablespoon of fish uh, hydrolyzed say it's one tablespoon of worm casting that's been liquefied and compost extract that's been liquefied one tablespoon. Um, usually I take a, like a whole cup, put it in compost tea, bait and strain it into a five gallon bucket. And then, then I can dilute it out from there. One teaspoon of kelp per three gallons of water. And so I use that for this root ball treatment. I use it for the watering every once a week and repeat 
Step four, weekly. If the plants are showing signs of lack of nitrogen, like these plants were stressed to the max and those little tomatoes. And so I gave them extra fish. I didn't in the beginning, right? I let them get over the transplant shock for a few days. All plants go through the transplant shock. And then I added a little more, just pure fish to water and gave it to them. And that gives them a, a direct boost of nitrogen that um, the microbes can make available to the plant like instantaneously. Then you may need to add, and this is where Dr. Elaine Ingham talks about, is that um, we have enough minerals in the soil that we shouldn't have to be adding them. But if we don't have enough microbes that can process those minerals and do the mineralization to get it to the plant, where this is our problem with human health is that's not happening. The, it's available in the soil, the microbes aren't there, and the population isn't high enough, and the diversity of microbes isn't high enough to get this to happen. So that's where we want it to happen. If it's not, say tomatoes and cal are gonna need calcium, right? It's, it's just like a given. So you might as well add some calcium to where the tomatoes are gonna go. I tend to do it twice a year, just to, because I already know my soils have got a cal um, calcium to magnesium ratio problem. So I've got to boost the calcium in order to fix the magnesium problem and to get enough calcium to those plants so I don't have blossom end rot. Next, try not to let your plants ever get stressed, not majorly stressed by no means, right? Now it's snowing out my window, so there's a few plants that probably are stressing, but that's environmental and I'm not gonna do anything about it. But when you water, you need to deep water and not do these little shots of baby water once a day. Try to do deep water and that will relieve a lot of stress. Um, this quorum sensing also works with plants. And so uh, Dr. Christine Jones recommends, recommends eight or more types, different types and kinds. And so think of, okay, I want a, a grass, a legume, a broadleaf. You want all these different types, right? And different kinds. Spray it on the plant. I just use a watering can and put it right on the plant, the mulch in the soil. And the microbes that are there are going to glue themselves to the plant. But the, the key thing that um, Dr. Jones taught me is the signal is there. And that's all that matters. If the signal is there, which it is, it's in the compost and the worm castings, and we put it into water, now we've given it to the plant. The plant gets the signal. Even if the microbe died, the plant still got the signal. And the plant still pumps out the rodexidates and wakes up the soil life that's already in your soil. It's okay, just amazing. Okay. So then how, if I make a, a, like a worm casting tea or liquefy the worm castings, mm -hmm. do I need to use that immediately or can I hold that over week to week or do I need to make it fresh every week? I make it fresh every week. I always use it up. But if I say I'm gonna be transplanting for the next two days, I don't dump that out, okay. right? I, for two days, you don't have any problem whatsoever. So like under the microscope, it's at 72 hours is like, um, uh, what is that, Cinderella? The clock is ticking. <laughs> okay. And so don't let it set for longer than 70 hours because things are gonna start going bad. You'll smell it go bad. And so then, then it's kind of turning over into more negative microbes than positive microbes, but all microbes can be good microbes with the switching of these genes. It's amazing. But we should get and we'll be healthy. That's our goal. So we're getting there. Yeah, and the worm back here, here's the recipe of fish hydrolysates. That's giving you some nitrogen. Worm castings is full of um, biology and nutrients. They're like a double whammy. I mean, if you can't do anything else, give your plant 
a tablespoon of liquefied worm castings. Um, putting in a little bit of humic, put it on here, but a little bit of humic will cloud that water into just a black. Okay, what other question? Calcium one is a tricky one. Yeah, so, you know, in, in Garfield County, our soils were formed through the oceans rising and falling more sedimentary plains. Right. There's a lot, lot of calcium carbonate in the soil. Is that calcium available to the plants? So that's our same problem here, Sue. We're on uh, the Milk River and it was the bottom of a lake at some mm -hmm. point, you know, and we've got a lot of sediments of different kinds and we have an extremely thick layer of clay. Right? Like they say it's 20 foot deep or something, I don't know, in places. And every summer when soil dries out, the soil cracks open into these great big cracks. Okay, so when we have those cracks from what Nicole Masters has taught me is now we have too much magnesium causing that to happen. So if they're uh, in a ratio, we got calcium here should be way higher than our magnesium. But if our magnesium is too high, even though our calcium is already high, we think it's fine. But it's not until we can raise that calcium to the same ratio as that magnesium. So I add um, gypsum, um, sometimes <laughs> liquid, sometimes granular. Uh, I put gypsum in my compost heap when I make it. I just made a heap um, three days ago and I added it to it. Those, those biology that are in that compost are gonna cycle all those nutrients, right? And they're, as they're doing that, there's signals going on. So in that compost, now we'll have a lot of the things I need just with that compost. But oh, lots, of, lots of tomatoes need calcium, so you could add it right. If you're going to put a tomato in a pot, which I don't recommend, but a lot of people do it, you need to add some calcium to it when you plant it in the beginning because it's going to suffer if you don't. And keep it water. JM Fortier told me last year, he's like, the problem is you're not, they're not sucking up the calcium off your roots, Jackie, because you're not watering it. Yeah, you gotta water. <laughs> I um, struggle with watering always. My husband's always like, water it, water it more. Stick your finger in the dirt and feel it. Cause I just look at the dirt and I'm like, oh, that's dark, it's wet, but it actually wasn't. And yeah. I got the boss of end right rot. Yes. But it's amazing as I watered, the boss of end rot went away. Yes. The other tomatoes didn't get it. Like they were fine. And then all of a sudden you go out there as soon as they start to turn red and there's the boss of end rot. And mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, oh. but if I kept watering them, it, it went away because he said it's because the calcium is not circulating to the roots. And so even though you have lots of calcium in your soil, it's not getting the roots because you're not watering enough. Anyway, yes. No. Lori has a question oh, about shoot. perennials. Okay, Lori. Yeah, um, so I just planted all these trees and bushes and um, one of the things that, I mean, the St. Lawrence Nurseries gives, sent this great book about basically instructions, right? And one right. of the things is not to feed the plants after July 1st um, so that they can start preparing for winter. Yes. Does that apply to the compost extract feeding because I mean I'm, I'm basically I'm going to be planting other things around them mm -hmm. right uh, annuals and stuff so what's what are your thoughts on um, is it the same thing or is, are they talking about something no. else so I don't think of what we're putting on with the compost extract as food okay or as nitrogen or as fertilizer don't think of it as fertilizer okay. think of it as we're giving out these signals because that's what Christine Jones says it really means. It says it doesn't matter if the microbes are alive or not. Mm -hmm. It means we are giving the signals to the plant. We're kind of tricking the plant into performing photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So you would put it out no matter what. If your plants don't need nitrogen, don't put the fish in. And your, your trees are going to, your your perennials will be fine. 
You just don't want to go and put in a nitrogen feed or a big fertilizer feed in August. And yeah. then those plants are going to try to grow top when they should be storing energy in their roots. So maybe and just reduce the fish in July and August. Yeah, if your plants don't need it, I don't even put it in. Okay. Yeah, which you just kind of monitor. You know, you see, oh, the plant, so tomato, the tomato is growing way more top than you want. It's got signals to grow more top because there's too much nitrogen available. Mm -hmm. When we want it having that big root mass and the top be equal, it's like a tree. Tree, they say, you look at the tree up above, the root system is just as massive down below. We want our tomato doing the same thing. So come fall and you pull up one tomato to see what's going on. If those roots just went like this and there wasn't many of them, uh, your plant was surviving by what you were putting on, not what the biology was helping deliver to the plant. Because that root should be massive and it should be um, a lot of root. Like the first year that I ever mulched tomatoes, I put straw mulch on. I had it young, my child was young and I was <laughs> working at uh, managing our ranch and our outfitting business. And I'm like, and I was the cook. I said, I don't have time to deal with these plants. I just mulched the whole garden with straw. My husband thought I was crazy. And come fall, I pulled, I used to pull all the plants. I don't pull any plants anymore other than to do a safety check and check, see, hey, what was going on down underneath it? Otherwise, I just let nature break them down. But then I would pull them, right? Because that's what I was taught. So I pulled them and I literally had five and six foot roots on those tomatoes because it chased underneath the mulch. Did I have blossom and rot? No. Did I have any pests? No. Right? So encourage those roots to grow. I'm really happy with my um, sheet mulching beds that I made last fall. The soil underneath them is just delicious. I mean, it's just like it's full of worms. I, you know, I planted several of the trees and bushes in there. Fantastic. Like, yeah, I'm Yay. I'm so excited. Isn't it fantastic when it when it works? You're just like, oh, yeah. And even even just the wood chips, you know, plant. I planted some rhubarb just in plain wood chip, you know, after that I had been covered in wood chips for several months, and and it looked great. Yeah. So sheet mulching is just like layered. Um, there was a layer. Sue was asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> as I take over here. Um, she passed. <laughs> so yeah, a layer, I layered cardboard and paper on the bottom to kind of keep the weeds down. And then there was a layer of, of um, nitrogen. I put some, well, I put some gypsum down first and then the cardboard and, and then some, some like a, a small nitrogen layer and then a uh, pretty thick layer of straw on top of that and then wood chips over the rest of it and that just like sat there all winter to to kind of decompose and cover the soil and it was an area it's areas where you know I've had just like lots of weeds and miscellaneous things growing so just a way of, of creating a bed Yes, and so I exciting when it works. On Facebook. What's that, Jackie? Eileen's watching on Facebook and sent us a question. Ooh, hi. She says, Is there a negative to making compost tea from kitchen scraps? Uh, compost. Well, you want to make compost itself from the chick from the kitchen scraps. Now it could be. Um, uh, it's got to be composted to make. Otherwise, and after that, you turn that into compost. Can you mix that with water and make compost tea from yes. that? Yes. Yeah, Mike yeah. does that too. Yep, for well, sure. Like, it's got to be composted, though. It can be, you know, from your, um, what's the one where you put the granules or barley and stuff in there? It can be 
simple ways to compost. And I think that's what we actually should talk about next week, Jackie, because still compost. We keep coming back every, every, every time we talk and every time we go into a subject, we still come back to what? Compost. We will be composting next in Jordan uh, with the conservation district down there. It's going to be exciting. So since uh, the population is not super high in Jordan, oh, we sure would like to see a bunch of people drive on down and see us in person. It's May 21st. Yes, the 21st. Yep. Two Don't weeks get confused. Yesterday. Sue's got to keep me straight here on the date. The 21st. It's a Friday afternoon, right? Yep. One o'clock at the county meeting room. Please come. It's yes. Be so fantastic. It will. And I, I uh, Sue, I started my pile, my, my first 21, 21A, I call it, pile for the year. I put everything in there except for the kitchen sink. I cleaned the refrigerator. I put everything I could think of in there. And I got to thinking, hmm, I wonder what really is growing in the kitchen sink. But I didn't go there. So, but the pile three days later is now 145 degrees and it's snowing out now, which the pile won't care. I got a lid over it. So super exciting. This is the part of the show where we ask you to become a Patreon or um, if you want to learn more from us on YouTube under the Grand Food Web, Patty Armbruster, Jackie Marie Byers podcast that is amazing. And it's on the green, of my guests. green organic garden podcast. And yeah, she's got guests that are out of this world. And so fantastic. Like so I'm in New York visiting my mom and the morning I jumped on the plane, I planted like a thousand sunflower seeds in a place where I did the same sheet mulching that Lori did last year. So the bed was ready. Because I always like to plant my sunflower seeds on Earth Day, but I was a little bit late. But I did that same thing, so very exciting. Fantastic, exciting. Oh, it's weird to see me on the iPad over here <laughs> <laughs> while I'm talking. Plus, okay. it's like typing up everything you said, Patty. <laughs> the close. Right. Caption. So, oh, from the, those of you on Facebook Live, if you would like to join us and become a Patreon, then you can hang on the line with the Zoom call here because we're going to get into individual questions and really help people. Hi, out. Facebook Livers. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. My mom down there listening because she's downstairs on the live Facebook. I don't know if she knows it. But I took her my iPad and I'm on her iPad up here. All right. Fantastic. Good job. I think we actually accomplished the technology this week. I'm just too. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs>